I have a few announcements to make. Trinity North Region CPWM will meet Saturday, September 11th at 9 a.m. at Pine Tree CPC. A light continental breakfast and registration will begin at 8.30 a.m. The offering collected will be given to the Stott Wallace Missionary Fund and CPW Convention highlights will be presented. All ladies are encouraged to attend. Our di diaconate meets today at 1230 in the conference room. Awanas kickoff. This Saturday, August 14th, beginning at 4 p.m., we will be having a kickoff party for children ages three through sixth grade, along with parents and helpers of our new Awanas program. We encourage all our children to come and enjoy. If you would like to help, please let Isabel Martinez know. And I know yesterday they had their official training. We will be honoring Pastor Rusty with the retirement reception on August 22nd at 3 p.m. We need your help in providing finger foods and helping set up and clean up. There are sign-up sheets in the narthex, so be sure to indicate how you can serve during this special time. Along with that, as part of the retirement reception, we will be giving Pastor Rusty a gift from the congregation. To help with the purchase of the gift, you are encouraged to put your donation in an envelope and mark it for Pastor Rusty's gift, or if using a check, make it out to the church and indicate on the memo line that it's for Pastor Rusty's gift. Today, we're very honored. We welcome to our pulpit today, Reverend Adrian Scott. Brother Scott is a Cumberland Presbyterian minister, and we are so happy to have you, and we look forward to his sharing the good news with us today. And now I'm going to ask uh, Elder Joe Cucinata to come forward. He has an announcement to make. Good morning, y'all. Um, guess I've been a little remiss here lately uh, being the team lead for the pastor search team, but just want to give you all a little update where we're at. Uh, we've posted some things in the bulletins and stuff, but uh, we have been trying to reach out as much as possible. Uh, I know there's some people out there have the idea that we've had a hundred or so applicants. We've actually only had six. And of those, um, most of them would probably have us in the same situation within a couple years we determined. So um, we are diligently trying to find somebody. We are reaching out, even trying to find an interim right now. Um, and um, that's about all I can tell you about it right now. And so if you all have any questions, just feel free to come and ask me directly or anyone on the team. Thank you. Now, if you will please stand. Open your hymnals to 634, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
Please remain standing for the call of worship. Wait for God who deals gently with us. Watch for God's appearance among us. Out of the depths we cry out to God. Will God hear our supplications? In all times and places, we can rely on God. We can know steadfast love here and now. We keep our morning watch together. We will support one another as we seek to know God. In, oh, I'm sorry. Find hope in God's power to redeem us. Give thanks for the new day God promises to us. Life's battles cannot destroy us. The losses we suffer are not the last word. We come to you, holy God, with our many needs. Some of us are people in authority with weighty decisions to make. Some of us are fighting battles we cannot win. Some have faced unexpected losses that tear at the very fiber of life. There are broken relationships among us feelings we do not want to admit, realities we do not want to face. There are also joys we have not really celebrated, reasons to give thanks to which we have never given voice. We welcome, O oh God, to be lifted out of our ruts and routines, seeking instead to find fullness of life with you. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. If God should mark iniquities, who could stand? If God counted our sins, how would we ever find forgiveness? God has provided us a way out. The attitude and actions that build barriers among us and shut God out of our thinking can be overcome. God is ready to help us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. O Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. How we have grieved you, how often our words have been bitter, filled with malice and anger. How easily have we uttered lies of pretension and self-protection. How readily we take for ourselves the rewards of another's labor. Forgive all that is false and evil within us and among us. Free us from the self-justifying excuses that keep us from reaching out to others. We, we want, want to believe, to trust, to, trust, to, to live, live as imitators of Jesus Christ. Christ. Help, Help us, gracious God. God. Amen. God redeems us from our iniquities. Forgiveness is ours to receive and to share. God gives us the opportunity to become members of one another, speaking truth with our neighbors, working honestly with our own hands building each other up and sharing with the needy. The gift of grace we have received grows larger in our lives as we extend it to friends and strangers we meet. Please stand, open your hymnals to 547 as we sing O oh, for a Closer Walk with God.
be seated. Thank you. We offer our prayers and sympathy to Maria Garcia's family in the loss of her brother, Fernando Garcia, was killed in a car accident last week. Maria is the mother of Carla Chavez, who plays the piano with Christy Godwin in the contemporary worship service. Martha Spencer is back in the Marshall Hospital with pneumonia. She is seriously ill. Chuck and Sandra Spencer covet your prayers on her behalf. Claire Fletcher continues to recover from bronchitis and related issues. Dolores Rustenhaven has been diagnosed with a blood clot and she is recovering at home. Remember to pray for our Awana Children's Wednesday evening program as it is close to the beginning time. <coughs> Juliana Dean, the daughter-in-law of David and Debbie, uh, went to the hospital last night. She has some pregnancy complications, so please keep all those in your prayers. We have the opportunity to express our gift, our thanks for gifts we have received from God, but did not deserve. We who have eaten manna in the wilderness are chosen to pass on the bread of life to neighbors in our own community and around the world. May our giving reflect the fragrant offering and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. At this time, if you'd like to bring your offerings to the baskets in the aisles, you can do so now. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your continuing providence, even when we complain. Thank you for the living bread, Jesus Christ, who feeds our spirits. In gratitude for undeserved grace and unlimited opportunity, we dedicate our offering and ourselves. Let our talk and our resources build up the body of Christ for greater service. May the needs of many be addressed in ways that bring hope, grace, and love to your children. Lift up those that we have mentioned that need our thoughts and prayers at this time and any that we don't know about. Bless all these things we ask in your name. Amen. Time is my pleasure to welcome to the pulp Reverend Adrian Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Sounds like you're glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. We're encouraged just having heard of your faith and the work that has been done over the years here at Cumberland Presbyterian Marshall. We're thankful to God for your ministry here in this community as well as uh, literally places around the world through your support of, of missions. It's our privilege to be here this morning. Uh, thankful for the God that my wife Cynthia is with me today and certainly the better part of our union. So uh, we're grateful. I'd like to attract your attention to the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers.
Numbers chapter 21, I'll read the first nine verses. Thank you. Numbers chapter 21, verse 1 through 9. The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, he heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was Hormah. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor to the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. The word of the Lord. Well, the preceding chapters of Numbers begin with chapter 11, particularly, that chronicles the deep satisfaction of the nation of Israel since they had been delivered from the misery of slavery in the land of Egypt. They found every conceivable thing to complain about. The baked bread and the cooked quail that they referred to as miserable food in chapter 21, verse 5, as we just read. The Israelites also complained about the water or the lack thereof. They complained about the hardships of travel and the size of their opponents in the land of Canaan of whom they were supposed to defeat. They even accused God of delivering them from the land of Egypt to simply die in the wilderness, hopelessly. And their list of complaints went on and on and on. There appears in this, the history of the Israelites that there was a cyclical relationship that they had in, with God in their life. It's when the Israel would sin, then they would repent eventually, and God would forgive them. It reminds us of ourselves, actually. The Israelites were moving closer to the land that God promised them, however. That's the land of Canaan. In return for God's favor of a victory over the Canaanites, the Israelites promised God they would return. They would repent. They would return to God and be faithful. They are going to be successful or successfully overcome the Canaanites. They strategized to travel to Canaan, taking the shortest route, and then attacked once they have, uh, have gotten within attacking distance. However, Israel would have to travel through Edom to facilitate this particular strategy. When Moses requested permission from the Edomites to travel through their land, thus giving them um, a strategic advantage, the Edomites refused. They then had to take the long way around the land of Edom as a default. It was a route along the Red Sea. It was an arduous journey for them. It was long, it was hot and weary, traveling with this dusty and rocky roads and uneven terrain. Additionally, additionally, they had suffered a tragedy. Moses' sister, Miriam, the one who often encouraged Moses, 
along with his brother Aaron, Moses' right hand and priest. They, both of them died in chapter 20, as it's recorded. In a moment of frustration and anger, maybe both, the Israelites spoke against God and against Moses, asking them, why have you brought us out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? You know, most of us want to die. When we think about it, we would like to die someplace familiar, someplace comfortable. Maybe even most people would prefer to die at home if that's an option. But the Israelites, they are terrified of the thought of dying in a waste, howling wilderness. And with all the complications of their journey, they ask God, why did you bring us out of the land of Egypt to die in this wilderness? Those Israelites who were hardened and bitter by their life's hard trials felt emboldened and perhaps some of the younger families joined in to hurl their insults at the very God of Israel who so recently, miraculously, and mercifully delivered them from the hand of Egypt's oppression. It was as if they were chastising God and shaking their fist at the Almighty because of their trouble. You know, to dare chastise God is the highest and most audacious of human acts. And to compare mere human intellect to divine wisdom is evidence of a severe lack of, of faith and sound judgment coupled with an abundance of arrogance and self-pride. With this latest and most blatant attack on God's good judgment, the Bible says in verse 6, The Lord sent fiery serpents into the camp and bit the people so that many of the Israelites died. A line was drawn and a line had been crossed. Israel crossed that line. And even in the casual reading of this text, it teaches us something very, very basic. And that is this, that sin has horrible consequences. The campers are not only ungrateful, but they are also tired. They are frustrated. They're bitter. They're angry. They, they possess a critical spirit. And now they are also sick and afraid and dying in our minds, we can envision the fatality strewn all over this Israelite camp. People are dying. It's a mess. If something isn't done, possibly everyone in the camp could die. Because of their sin, we see Israelite, the Israelites as an undeserving people. With the death count of family and friends dying from poisonous venom, it's very obvious that there's something deadly in this serpent's bite. And here in this text, the Bible gives us a clue that this is the true appraisal of sin. Sin is deadly. It seems that every camp and every family has its victims. Well, it's true. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every human being born in this world has been bitten by this serpent. Homes are quickly becoming fatherless, motherless, even childless. In this instance, the even-handed and non-discriminating arm of divine judgment is the chilly hand of death. I ask you a question this morning as we ponder this text. Is this serpent's bite somehow a picture of the stinging, deadly nature of sin with this dire consequences of pain and sorrow, regret, separation, and ultimate death? And if so, are these Israelites the only ones bitten by this serpent? As I mentioned a moment ago, all of humanity, beginning with Adam's fall, are brought forth in iniquity, the 51st Psalm tells us, born in sin and shapen in iniquity, I believe as the King James Version says it. It speaks of humanity's total depravity, or as F.F. F. Bruce calls it, it speaks of humanity's inherited depravity, or the state of human beings at birth. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 3, verse 23. We were injected with the venom of disobedience and rebellion against the heavenly authority. And the effect of sin is this. Sin still stings. Because of sin, we live with the stress of family and work-life balance. That stings. The issues of aging poorly, that stings. Issues of crumbling family structure and weakened personal relationships, that stings. Ill health and frail financial concerns, they all sting. The result of death, or sin, I should say, still stings. Verse 7 says this, we've sinned for we've spoken against the Lord and against Moses. Pray to the Lord Moses that he takes away the serpents from us. The, uh, the comprehension, the understanding, the, the coming to their senses that they have sinned grossly against the Lord moves the Israelites now to confession. After sin comes confession, hopefully. And now the Israelites bring their confession of sin. The people realize the snakes, these troubles they're facing, these fiery bites and deadly sicknesses, these feelings of self-righteousness, self-sufficiency and arrogancy, this anger and bitterness and complaining, it will not leave them on its own. Pray to God that he takes away the serpents from us. They need a God intervention. They need a God who will provide a remedy for their hopeless circumstance. The Lord would help them, but it would require a measure of their own faith. Make a fiery serpent, the Lord tells Moses, and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, he shall live. Verse 8. This is God's remedy for sick and dying Israelites. There is no other solution we should be reminded. This is it. Take a serpent, put it on a pole, run to the center of the camp, Moses, and stand there and hold it high. And everyone who sees it will live. That's the only solution. To look at a dead, lifeless figure on a pole was the only instruction for life and healing. It's a simple prescription, however, and it reminds us of the simplicity of the gospel message. Those who dare cast a saving look, God promised to forgive and they will live. They would not have to die without a savior. That serpent on a pole was an accurate representation of the fiery serpents whose sting had affected the entire camp. The serpent then served as a mirror of their sin, the reason for their condition. So someone in the camp thought, well, I'm very sick, I'm dying, or my brother is dying, or my wife is dying, or my son is dying, but that's silly to stand here and look at a pole and think we would be healed. It's too simple of a solution. It doesn't make sense. What's the connection between this pole and science? There is none. Someone else said, the last thing I want to do is to look at that pole that has that serpent attached to it because it reminds me of my sin. But isn't that the point? It served to remind them of their sin and their guilt and also remind them of one who would come and take away their guilt and their pain. It is a look of faith. They're weak and dying. The life is fleeing from their bodies. They cannot walk to a serpent. They cannot run to it lest they think it's their own efforts that save them. So it's a rather simple but powerful prescription. Just look at it. Amid such pitiful conditions, such horrific suffering and numbing sorrow, Moses points them to the one lifted up. Look to the one who heals in sickness, who soothes our sorrows and lifts heavy burdens, the one who gives us peace in troubling times, 
and sends a wave of hope when otherwise we're drowning in the hopelessness. Look to that figure who is hoisted high and hung long enough on that pole so that everyone who dared look would live. Oh, Moses wasn't instructed to leave it there for a minute or two or five or 30 minutes. But time must have been given so that everyone who desired to be healed would see the uplifted servant and would live. That's the grace and mercy of God. That God would let us live long enough to come to the realization that he is our only hope and our only help. People of Israel, look to the one hoisted high above the chaos of this camp. Look to the one lifted up for us. The only purpose that serpent, serpent was lifted up was for those dying in the camp. This text has its biblical historical significance, but it also clearly points us to the one hoisted on a wooden beam 2,000 years ago whose whole purpose was to be a reminder of our sin, but more effectively, he had also reminded us that he is our substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. To be reminded of the simplicity of the gospel message, as Paul writes this, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And I reference Paul, but it's actually John 3, 15. You can look at this one on the tree stretched wide and high because this one, Christ, he has no poison, no sin, but he brings life. He does not represent death, but he represents new life. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. John also writes in John 10, 10. He knew no sin, but became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Notice that this figure on the pole has the power of life and death. If you look, you'll live. If you refuse to look, you'll die. If you only look in faith, Look to this one lifted, elevated high above all others and fixed on a pole. You will not perish, but have life. This is a call to Israel's obedience and saving faith in the word of God. This is what Moses said from the mouth of God. Look and live. So only look this way. Romans 5, 6 says, why we were still weak. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The right time is still while there is time. Don't look at the pole. Don't be confused, Israel. Don't look at the pole. It can't save you. Look at the one hoisted on the pole. Don't look at the institutional church or its members or its officers or its pastors, its leaders. We can't save you. Look to the one hoisted high for you. If you're tired, look. Israel, if you're frustrated, look. If you're lonely, look. If you're heartbroken, look. Troubled, look. If you're hurting, look. When you look, Jesus will work. And when they look that way, death and separation was brought to its knees. Sickness and pain was left fleeing hopelessness took leave and life replaced death because of that look death no longer had power over those who dared look to the one raised for them this is the hope we have in jesus the beginner and the author the finisher in our of our faith look to the one lifted for us the cross of christ is as i close it is the solution to sin Christian, are you again weary of sin's sting? Have you in your anger, your bitterness or shame refused to look to Jesus for healing? Do you feel entitled? Do you feel like you deserve the Lord's forgiveness and healing? What about our unworthiness? Saints and sinners, I point you to Jesus. 
look this way and you too can be healed and lived. Someone once said, a crossless Christianity does not exist. The Lord bless you. Let's stand for a hymn of commitment. Page 641. Peace be with you all, and may all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. The Lord be with you.